With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. Bath, Bisham Abbey, Lillishall, Loughborough, Manchester, Sheffield and Home Pierpont. The seven high performance centres around the country that come under the recently rebranded UK Sports Institute. And you may have heard our recent visit to Bisham Abbey in a previous Anything But Footy episode. But it got us thinking, how do all these places combine and how do they help the right people? I'm John. And I'm Michael. And like Great British Bosses, which speaks to the men and women behind British sport in this country, the UK Sports Institute, recently rebranded, for the past 20 years has worked quietly behind the scenes to contribute to more than 1,000 British Olympic and Paralympic medals. And we are delighted to be joined by the man who is now in charge of making sure that continues. Hello, I'm Matt Archibald, Chief Executive of the UK Sports Institute. So, Matt, you heard our intro. How does it all join together when you're across so many sites? It's an interesting question, and it's not without its complexities from from time to time. But essentially, it's down to 400 or so brilliant individuals that work for the Institute, coordinated either via sites such as the one Bisham I'm in today or the other seven or so you mentioned, um, or at um, coordinated via the sports-specific standalone sites such as Ten Acres Lane for Taekwondo, the Velodrome, Weymouth for Sailing. So... We're a very kind of agile organisation that has pods of people working in uh, literally dozens of environments uh, at home and abroad. So we're kind of virtual and we've always been virtual, um, borderline nomadic sometimes. So we've always had to work in that network way, even pre-COVID and now sort of post-COVID, it's even probably more dispersed as well. So, um, yeah, we're an organisation that that has lots of homes, but no single home. And, and effectively, we follow athletes and sports to where they need to be to perform. Michael mentioned a staggering number of Olympic and Paralympic medals, which I'm sure we'll come on to in a moment, and, and your role in that. But people will probably know the UK Sports Institute as the English Institute of Sport. Why the rebrand? So the, the main reason for the rebrand from the English Institute of Sport was, I suppose, caught up in, in the Home Nations uh, discussion and and really just to align us with British sport more widely. So our primary partners are UK Sport, who fund us, uh, the government agency who receive all the exchequer and lottery funding for high performance sport. We work with the British Paralympic Association, the British Olympic Association at Games Time, and the vast majority of the world class programmes which receive funding from UK Sport are British bodies. So it, it was always a bit of a misnomer that we were called the English Institute of Sport. And for many of the Scottish and Welsh athletes that were being looked after by you know an EIS physio etc it just didn't sort of sit quite right and didn't align correctly so the decision was made it had been long talked about and indeed back in the early days in 2002 when the organization was first conceived it was actually called the UK Sports Institute on the first few bits of paper and then it somehow got changed I don't really know the background to be honest but uh, anyway I came into the job uh, as the EIS but the decision had already been made to uh, rename us the UK Sports Institute which we did earlier this year and it's actually gone surprisingly smoothly as in we haven't changed 
a great deal. We've had a, a minor change to logo. We've changed name. We've changed some branding, which all needed a refresh across our sites because it's kind of straddled four or five Olympic cycles. So some of it was pretty tired. Um, and, and I think because it makes such sense in terms of alignment with British sports bodies, um, it's passed by without too much notice or comment, really. I mean, I think we were slightly worried probably for our people that they'd built up this kind of allegiance and nostalgia for the EIS. But I think they're, they're adaptable people and they've quickly embraced the, the new UK SI name. We don't abbreviate it We uh, yet. We don't have a we, we, we deliberately avoid the UCSI uh, terminology. So we are very much the Institute if you want to abbreviate it or UK Sports Institute. So what is it that the UK Sports Institute actually does with the athletes? What services are you providing? Yeah, well, we, we provide a huge number of services, really. I mean, typically they are in health and performance support. So we have sports medicine doctors, um, we have physios, um, et cetera. We have an intensive rehab unit at Bisham, which deals with any athletes with you know serious post-surgery or ongoing issues. And then we deal with other you know sports science um, areas such as nutrition, strength and conditioning, um, physiology. So effectively, we deliver that whole card of services through the sports science, sports medicine, but we go wider than that into areas such as performance lifestyle, um, which is obviously a key part of looking after the approximately 1,100 athletes that are funded through the uh, Olympic and Paralympic programs. So, you know, it, it's quite a broad service offering that we do. We run the facilities, we run gyms, we run labs, probably delivers things um, that for what are a lot of relatively small organisations they, they couldn't do on their own. So we provide that scale, scope and expertise to enter into areas such as innovation, designing bikes, boats, um, new saddles, new kit for uh, sports, etc. So w- we're pretty broad. So you know Hughes Factory and the James yeah. Bond movies. Are you the sport equivalent of that? Well, well, I'm I'm not, but I know a man and a team who are. So we have Matt Parker, who's our Director of Performance Innovation and with Naomi and the team, there, they actually have a, an office, which uh, it's not top secret, but you didn't have it on your list, but it's, it's relatively new and that's in Silverstone. So they they kind of hang around up there. There are wind tunnels. They're looking at producing a, a funky swim flume as well. And and they, they are the people who are effectively in, in that you know secret area, some of which we can talk about uh, in advance, some of which we talk about after the event when hopefully we've created a competitive advantage and helped athletes in sports um, you know take advantage at games time. And it's right across the Olympic and Paralympic movement within this country as well, isn't it? That's right. Across summer and winter, there effectively isn't isn't a funded sport that we don't um, touch and work with. Sports aren't mandated to work for us, but um, most of them do. There are some services such as performance lifestyle and the coordination function of head of performance support that tends to be centrally funded. So the sports get an allocation of time. But for most services such as physio, medicine, nutrition they would they would pay us for those services and we charge a a market rate and we provide some things centrally and, and some things bespoke to sport fair to say matt that you don't really shout about your success too much no i think i think sometimes we get criticized for that and we're kind of i suppose going through a process as we look at the next cycle of wondering how loud to shout what to shout or whether just to give other people the stories to shout about so we work in that ecosystem as i mentioned before with uk sport the boa and the bpa and really, it's probably the BOA and the BPA that are the brands, Team GB, Paralympics GB, that, that shout about the success of the nation. And I think it would be a crowded marketplace if we tried to do too much shouting. Um, success has a thousand fathers. And if we all try and claim everyone's medals, it gets pretty, pretty messy. So I think um, we historically have have stood back and allowed athletes, rightly, and sports and probably UK Sport, BOA, BPA to, to claim more of the success. We're very proud to support and to be a key contributor to that. Just to give you an idea, I would say if if we assume that the team size supporting the athletes in Paris might be approaching 400 people, we'd be over 100 of that contingent, you know, under secondment or through accredited routes. So we're probably 25 percent, somewhere 20, 30 percent of of the team going to Paris at the Olympics, slightly fewer Paralympics. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're pretty significant and the same in those daily training environments. So we have. Uh, 15, 16, 17 people on, on the books working with hockey at the moment, doing sort of 12 person full time equivalent work. Um, so, you, you know, we're pretty significant footprint in, in all those big Olympic and Paralympic sports. So we don't have that kind of commercial profile and we're not selling a brand as such. But I think there are talks afoot in the, in the sector about how we can do more to make 
Paralympics GB, Team GB come alive four years round and be more commercial. So we may well have some of the stories that Penny Briscoe or Mark England may like to talk about and may help leverage, bring some more funding into the system. And is there perhaps a good reason for not shouting about your success? Because do other nations look at what you are doing and what you might be doing in Silverstone that you mentioned there and thinking we want a piece of that? It's funny you mentioned that. I've got two two people from the Australian Institute of Sport trying to come and visit us at Silverstone next Wednesday. So um, we we kind of uh, we do collaborate in sport and certainly in areas of health. We're we're very open with um, uh, concussion, for example. It, you know, there are some obvious areas where it's a, a non competition area where we just want to do the best for the athletes. But there are areas where we're deliberately guarded. But we we actively go out and. Um, look at what other people are doing and we tolerate a certain amount of sports uh, and nations coming in and, and speaking to us and trying to learn from us so we're fairly collaborative internationally but we certainly don't uh, give away all our secrets and in, indeed I'm not told quite a lot of the secrets because they probably think I'd blab them out so uh, yeah I, I'm not always told exactly what we're doing until pretty much we've done it and it's uh, on the on the track in the velodrome uh, for example. And you mentioned concussion there, for example, and that's conversations that we're having and that's been ongoing. Women's health is a conversation we're having around elite sports. But I'm presuming these are conversations, although we're having them now, you've been having them for quite some time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the advantages of having experts and and, and a a good cohort of centralised experts is we can create those communities of practice and expertise that look at these areas. So concussion, we are very much involved through our director of clinical governance in in all the concussion uh, sort of groups that exist within the UK in terms of looking at the latest data and working out how that impacts on sport. And, and the same with female athlete health and performance. We've been a lead as there are clinics run out of Bisham, um, Dr. Anita Biswas, Rich Burden have all been in, in this area, working in this area for years. There's still a lot more to be done, but we certainly are, are proud of the work we've done and, you know, perhaps should be talking about it more frequently because there are definite areas where we haven't yet reached. And e- even within the Olympic and Paralympic worlds, there are some pockets where we probably need to do to do more. And on that, Matt, what I would really like to understand is, do you go to the, the sports that you, you said you worked with the Olympic and Paralympic sports in Britain and say, here's some research we've done or investigators that we've done and you really should know this, or is it about them coming to you and saying, look, actually, we've got problem with with women's health in, in this sport in particular or concussion in this sport. Can you help us? How does that relationship work? Yeah, I think it's definitely two ways. So I mean, if you're a curious, highly curious sport with practitioners, coaches, athletes that, that want to speak to us, then the door is always open and there are lots of opportunities to engage with us. Um, however, we also in the background run, as you would imagine, some fairly significant diagnostic work on athlete numbers so every single olympic and paralympic athlete give or take a couple probably are are registered via a central medical database so we can track all those numbers and we do by sport by sex uh, etc and we certainly would uh, we have a small athlete health team centrally who would go to sports if they picked up that there was a higher incidence of concussion or hip injury or uh, whatever it was respiratory health so sometimes these things are, are a little bit hidden and a bit of a surprise and we'll take them to a sport and say, we've noticed this, you know, why might this be the case? Some of the interesting ones are obviously to do well, to do with respiratory health and uh, sort of gastro uh, infections, I think, with, with some of the water-based sports um, which were picked up and certain hygiene factors can be brought in, which then improve uh, and reduce days lost to training, which is a, a key thing. Um, so there are qu- quite a few things and indeed there were some interesting COVID responses where I think, you know, post COVID, when people let their guard down again, there were there was an increase in respiratory illness, whereas it had actually been relatively low through various periods of the pandemic. So some interesting trends that are observed by our um, medics in that area. And then they're relayed to sport via an athlete health team that work directly with sports. And one of the things that I think we saw at Bisham Abbey or was spoken to was about the heat and the fact that the world is getting warmer and, and sport is having to cope with that and athletes are going to have to cope with extreme temperatures. I think one of the things that Michael and I um, struggled with listening to the commentary from the World Athletics Championships in Budapest, where the commentators kept saying, well, it's very hot, but there's nothing anyone can do about it. But actually, at UK Sports Institute, you can prepare for heat, can't you? Yeah, I mean, we do have access to heat chambers, um, uh, both here in Manchester as well. So it, it is something that sports prepare for. I mean, in, in fairness, most of them are summer sports um, and get used to it over the years, hot years, cold years, but there are more hotter years now. So I think it's something that people are 
getting increasingly aware of and can't hide from. So I think for some reason, particularly in the outdoor sports, particularly in endurance sports, um, people are um, increasingly aware, probably pay more attention and also understand the volatility around Paris, which could be, you know, in the 20s or it could be in the up into the, you know, touching 40 or something on, on a crazy day. So I, I think people know that we do give them opportunities to acclimatise. Um, so, so, yeah. A significant amount of work is done on that. There are also garments that you can wear that help, you know, cool, etc. Et and and those are areas that our performance innovation team certainly explore with sports where where there's deemed to be a performance benefit. Just one sort of final question on that. When we had that trip to Bisham Abbey, the level of detail that you guys go into. So, for example, there was a discussion around hay fever and one of the venues in Paris. They said if you're a hay fever sufferer, the planned journey into that venue might be a negative to your performance because it was going to be going through a forest. So, I mean, is that the level of kind of detail that you work with in terms of preparing for these big events? Yeah, I'm not, I, I like to think that the, the system itself, and that's not 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 just the Institute, has has become you know very sophisticated and, and we do learn and debrief after all the major championship sports do after all their championships. So I think we're layering on knowledge and, and, and because we've got some pretty good continuity in a, in a quite professionalised environment, um, people do learn, remember and, and factor into the next time. So you then get into the fairly small level of detail and that might be, you know, considering what trees are in pollen outside your accommodation at the uh, uh, Paralympic or Olympic village uh, and whether there's air conditioning units or not or how that's all going to work and how long the walks are between X and Y and stuff. So, yeah, I think we're, you know, we take it seriously. I think we have a lot of fun in, in this sector as well and it remains interesting and and, and vibrant but i think we take it really seriously and if we think there's an advantage or 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 a misstep that can be avoided we we do put significant resource into trying to predict that and and deal with it to, so it's not an issue you use the word fun there so let's rewind to your career you started at deloitte is elite sport more fun than deloitte uh, that's a very good question in terms of fun yeah i started in deloitte in aberdeen and and in fairness um it was a lot of fun, actually, when you've got a lot of young people all coming together and, and training. It was more an extension of, I suppose, further education for me. And uh, I wanted to be in Aberdeen for personal reasons. And my wife was training up there. So so I started up there. The closest I got to elite sport there was Pitodri. We used to audit Aberdeen Football Club. They never let me do that audit, but I did go to Pitodri a couple of times, which was good fun. But yes, elite sport is definitely more fun than accountancy, albeit um, if you're an accountancy partner versus a CEO of a a, a, a British sporting organisation, I think you can retire a fair bit earlier. So there, there's pros and cons, but I, I wouldn't swap it. And my career has certainly been extremely interesting, um, even at Deloitte, but more so probably since since I've less, left and joined Sport England at the kind of end of the Athens cycle. So that was my first introduction to more grassroots sport. But you, Sport England sat across a few sports, including boxing, um, in, that, in that cycle. So, um, yeah, that was where I got my introduction into the world of sport. We're talking to Matt Archibald, the chief exec of UK Sports Institute. This is Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, price line. This is Anything But Footy, Great British Bosses. And we're talking to Matt Archibald, the CEO of UK Sports Institute. Matt, you just touched on your career from Deloitte to where you are now. H- how does that happen? And and, and was that something that you you planned or did it just come your way? I think... Planning would certainly be too strong a term. I think I would say that I um, either didn't have a great deal of patience, but I was always fascinated and uh, thoroughly enjoyed sport as a participant of no great um, merit. Um, But I've always wanted to have an interest-led career and also I'd say kind of an ethical career. And I know sport throws up some some of these quandaries from time to time, but certainly I've never for a minute felt that the last 20 years I've spent in, in, in this environment has been anything other than you know, good for the people um, that are affected by it, good for the country, etc. So I feel it, it, it is both interesting and uh, I feel it's a, an, an ethical um, place in which we work with strong values and I really enjoy it and, and get full motivation from it. Um, only this morning I was in the 
uh, in our intensive rehab unit, I saw a young gymnast, a bobsleigh athlete, and they're both in getting kind of looked after and cared for by our practitioners. And they've got their own dreams at presumably Milan, Cortina, Paris, LA. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of brilliant people being well supported in, in this uh, sector. And I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Now, you came to the UK Sports Institute in February 2022 after four years at Taekwondo. I want to talk, we'll talk about that and, and your success there. But you also worked, as you mentioned, for Sport England and then GB Boxing. And then you were responsible for the boxing at London 2012. I mean, that is a is a remarkable thing to have delivered down at the XL. Yeah, I mean, it was that that has to go down as I think for anyone that worked for LOCOG is probably in their career highlights, if not highlight. And I remember our chief executive at the time, who was, um, I think, a banker in background, Paul Dighton, and he, he always used to say this, this will be I don't care how old you are, what stage of your career, and this will be the best job you've ever had. And uh, I think they were pretty, pretty wise words from Paul, actually. And certainly when I look back, certainly in terms of anecdotes those pinch yourself moments uh, and the pride that that event um surpassed everything else just because of the scale and and the, the, the fact that it impacted on absolutely everyone and all of a sudden you had the most interesting job out of all your kids parents etc which hasn't always been the case but um certainly for those three or four years as we got ready and, and went through the olympics and paralympics um that 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 was just just unreal i appreciate it's probably not part of your remit but should we be ambitious to try and do something like that again, Matt? Yes, 100%. And uh, I, I don't know when I'm going to retire. It'll probably be in the 2040s. And I'm a little bit worried that we might not get an, uh, another Games before then. So I think, uh, where are we? 2032 is is Brisbane, isn't it? It's tied up. 2036, people are talking about India. Certainly 2036, 2040, 2044. Um, you know, I catch up with Simon Morton, Sally Monday regularly. And I'm always trying to impress on them that let, let's get another home Games. We had... Home Games 2012, we had three Commonwealths, 02, 14, 22. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like we uh, definitely could do with uh, another Home Games to get us all revved up again. And again, I appreciate it's not really your remit, but the Commonwealth Games, there's there's obviously issues around the staging of that going forward. Are events like that important for organisations like you and for the athletes that you work with? Would you support trying to bring another Commonwealth Games back to the UK, stepping in perhaps? Yeah, I mean, de- definitely. I mean, the Commonwealth Games is significant for us, albeit you can argue that European Games, European Championships, World Championships are often more significant in terms of Olympic and Paralympic qualification, uh, which is our ultimate goal and often have a stronger feel. But I think there is something special um, about the history of this nation and the Commonwealth Games. I mean, we don't know much about the Mediterranean Games, but it's pretty significant for you know some of the Southern and, and European countries. So I think... Um, I definitely think there's a place for it. It definitely seems that they're in a process of kind of reevaluating how they do things and how they work with hosts. So I'm sure it'll need to change quite significantly, but I think it's the sort of organisation and movement that could change quite quickly um, relative to Olympic and Paralympic. So I think in that regard, they've probably got an advantage and could move quickly and, and adjust and, and remain relevant. And as long as they do that, that, then I think Olympic and Paralympic sports within the UK will get behind them, field strong teams and, and take them extremely seriously. You talked about your passion for Olympic sport, Matt. Um, boxing is at real risk of not being in LA. What would you say if there was no boxing in the Olympics? I mean, I, I do think it would be a travesty and it would be fundamentally down to, you know, the governance, uh, poor governance and, and the poor leadership internationally um, by the sport, uh, which I witnessed firsthand in a previous incarnation at London 2012. So it's been dogged by it um, since well before that uh, regime was in, in place. So I, I've got very little time for the it, the way that the International Federation has been run over the last multiple Olympic and Paralympic cycle. So I would applaud the IOC in terms of talking tough and, and acting pretty tough. Um, can boxing sort itself out? I know there's a, there's the new International Federation been set up and I very much hope that the National Olympic Committees will all get behind that and and, and join that federation because I do think it's the way forward. So I, I don't think it will happen, if I'm honest. Um, I, I think that the IOC are looking for ways to to make it happen, and they'll step in as they did do um, as they did do in Tokyo. I think to make it happen, but I don't think that will go on forever. I think there is a, a point at which they would call it. But I think, given the history pedigree of the sport, um, we're unlikely to see it disappear without a significant you know struggle from the IOC, who I think clearly want to keep it as well. And, and the emergence of 
women's boxing, which started in 2012, um, which was one of the, the, the great moments for us there, um, I think has, has strengthened the sport further as well. But they do need to reform internationally significantly. And also, the Olympics has announced these new sports that are coming for LA 2028. You're going to have to increase your remit at the UK Sports Institute. Yes. I mean, there was a period at which it felt that it was one in, one out, and they were balancing numbers. And now it feels like it's just hosts uh, uh, kind of nominating sports, cricket, flag football, what is it, baseball, softball. We've lacrosse. Got squash, lacrosse. Yeah, so I mean, some sports we're good at. So yeah, again, interesting and again, keeps our world interesting. And that's, you know, one of the things I love about our our world is I can be up and down the country at different sites, seeing different sizes, shapes of, of athletes. And, and there is really something for everyone. So I think the movement is is strong. I think, you know, it's it's difficult if you parachute sports in for one cycle, as we saw with karate. Um, we were involved at Taekwondo at trying to help um, one of the athletes, Jordan Thomas, um, qualify, which unfortunately didn't and, and, and make a success of it. But it was actually taken out of the games before it even started, as in, so you went into Paris knowing this was your first and last Olympic experience, which I don't think can help. And it doesn't help government get behind sports and fund them so I think you need a, a degree of stability but I, I guess the innovation and some of the sports we've seen come in are, are really exciting and by definition I think some sports do get a bit tired and maybe do need to sometimes drop out as well. You mentioned Taekwondo you obviously had a, a spell there as as the chief executive um, with GB Taekwondo I mean what a fantastic example of a sport that went from absolutely nothing in terms of Olympic and Paralympic world to being such a huge success for Great Britain. There's got to be lessons there for other emerging sports to say, look, within 20 years, within three or four games, you can go from nothing to winning three, four, five Olympic medals at one game. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you're absolutely right. And sometimes it feels almost impossible when you look at other international teams and in, in various sports that we're not competitive in and see how strong they are. And you think, how could we possibly bridge that gap? But if you get a few pioneering athletes some great coaches and, and a performance leader of the ilk uh, with the dedication of someone like Gary Hall, who, you know, leaves truly leaves no stone unturned and eats, sleeps and uh, dreams Taekwondo, then these, these things can happen. And if you get the support of a system, um, which again, you know, funds these brilliant youngsters to become full-time, you know, effectively professional athletes in, in terms of behaviors, then you can make some, some ground very quickly for me. What we saw, again, was boxing was a long-established sport, but we used to periodically throw up the odd medalist, um, typically one per game. We had Audley Harrison, 2000, but he was in a team of two. We had Amir Khan on his own in 2004, um, uh, winning the, the famous silver medal as a 17-year-old. But then when we went to Beijing, we had eight athletes qualified, seven of whom ended up getting there, um, and won three medals. And pretty much, you know, we had a great coach in, in Terry Edwards, but... The fact that those athletes in 2006 went full-time lottery funded, that was the, the big seismic shift. They were no longer club-based athletes who were just getting on a plane and trying to do the best they could against full-time international competitors. They were full-time themselves and they performed brilliantly and have continued to do so. And Taekwondo you know, is a similar story and, and just as successful. So is there perhaps a criticism that could be levelled after London 2012 that maybe having started programmes for sports like volleyball and basketball because as the host nation we got to take part in the Olympics in those sports that we didn't pursue that because 12, 14 years on from London 2012 we could maybe have a competitive volleyball or basketball team. Yeah, I mean, I think there is, there's got to be, a, I suppose, a, a balance and a, and a critical mass. You see nations that specialise in sports. I and mean, we've just seen New Zealand and, and South Africa, who certainly don't have the same Olympic, Paralympic presence that we do. But in rugby, they're, you know, dominant forces. And 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 we see certain uh, Olympic and Paralympic nations specialise. So I think there is a danger. If you go too wide, then the, the talent gets kind of uh, watered down. So I think there's there's two elements to it. It's one, you know, how big is your population? How wide is your talent? And, and two, it's available funding. And and UK sport have a very difficult call every four years, as do Sport England, in terms of how to allocate a finite pot uh, amongst a, a, a large number of sports. And are you funding everyone some money or are you giving you know the competitive sports enough to get by? So I think I, I'd struggle having worked there as well. And I've seen the tensions and, and the, dis the discussions. Everyone would like a bit more money so that everyone could get a, a base level of funding. But that level of funding just doesn't exist. So unless we can draw in more commercial income, which, you know, is a possibility. And um, as I say, Team GB, Paralympics GB do do a good job there. But if we can bring in some more money, then we probably could go further and sustain it. But I think those 
short term single cycle investments, you know, are, are unlikely to yield um, results. Albeit, you know, certainly in the Paralympic world, we saw power of Taekwondo came in uh, for Tokyo and we started up a program for, from nothing with, yes, there were some um, regional athletes. Amy Truesdale had been a pioneer and had won at the world stage, but it was a small sport. And by the end of Tokyo, uh, the year delay probably didn't hurt us. We ended up with three Paralympic medalists in, in Tokyo. So again, in a two, three year period, you can go from a, a standing start as Beth Munro did from a netball player, um, I think, into a, a Taekwondo silver medalist. Final couple of questions from me, Matt. Are you guys busier now in the run up to the Paris Olympic and Paralympics or will you be busier during like July and then games time? Well, that's a very good question. There are various different cycles in play, I think, for our organisation. So we're big enough that we straddle a few. So I would say practitioners of whom at least 50 percent are, are out in the field with the sports um, you know, embedded and they've had an incredibly big, busy uh, summer of sport. Um, most sports, you know, having their calendar through through the summer and most sports doing the majority of their qualification work. So it's been a hugely busy year in what's already a compressed three year Olympic cycle. So this year has been hugely busy. Hopefully some of them have a bit of downtime. But I know, again, hockey, for example, January, they're off again to try and qualify um you know those spots so it's kind of no rest to be honest until you're qualified then you might have a bit of time to focus on you know periodization periodization and getting your phases right into into paris um so i would say different and and some of our functions are more now looking towards la as well um or some of the performance innovation team you know they're bringing together projects and getting them ready now with a view to testing them prior to to Paris. So I would say we, we have enough different functions that it kind of it remains busy throughout. Perversely, a, a kind of HQ sort of role like I do, it gets a bit quieter in the summer because everyone's out and the sports are out, you know, working like crazy. So we get a bit quieter. We then pick up in autumn and uh, a, a, and early in the new year a bit with more of our planning work. So the mixture, I think it's fairly well done throughout the year. And actually at games time, although we have a quarter of our organization probably out there then there's probably three quarters two thirds who are at home so it might you know it's a quiet time where we can reflect and hopefully recharge and watch some of it on uh, uh, on telly am i right in saying that you speak french matt i do speak reasonable french not so, brilliant so don't embarrass me but I, I had a year out there as a student in grenoble um in in near the alps so yeah reasonable I was wondering if you'd been signed up for the Paris Games to try and uh, uh, bridge that uh, language gap. No, not at all. I mean, I think there's, well, actually, I say that, but um, no, there are plenty of French speakers within Team GB, I think. And uh, certainly plenty of my colleagues are actually working at Paris 2024. So, yeah, it's, it's lovely to see some colleagues. And in fact, Sophie Laurent, who was one of the French contingent that came over to London, I saw her on a, a, a Paris video the other day and it was nice to see her walking around what's going to be the dining hall explaining to everyone watching this video how it was going to be. So that that kind of network of people you meet through a games exists and, and certainly I'm looking forward to seeing some old friends um, in Paris. Uh, not quite sure where, but there will be plenty of them there, I'm sure. Well, fascinating discussion and thank you so much for your time. Merci beaucoup, uh, Matt Archibald, the CEO. <laughs> of the UK Sports Institute. Thank you for talking to great British bosses from anything but footy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, John. Enjoyed catching up as ever. Sports Social Podcast Network. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.